If you're the type of person for whom that first yellowing leaf, that first September morning chill sends you into absolute hysterics for the autumn season, then The Tale of Genji is a book for you. If you're the type of person who's a hopeless romantic plagued by golden age syndrome, but you kind of love that about yourself and you're not interested in changing it, no matter how much grief and longing and ennui and discontent it causes you, well, The Tale of Genji is probably a book for you. If you're the type of person who constantly wrestles with Tennyson's words that tis better to have loved and lost than never to have loved at all, then The Tale of Genji is a book for you. If you're the type of person for whom a silent, cold, dark, snow-covered night fills you with a pleasure so intense it sort of aches, then The Tale of Genji is a book for you. If you're the type of person where you almost feel more comfort and satisfaction just knowing that other people have the same questions in this life that you do, and that, in a sense, is better to you than having answers, well, then The Tale of Genji is definitely a book for you. Or if you're just the type of person who doesn't want to let this life slip by without experiencing one of the world's masterpieces of literature, then The Tale of Genji is a book for you. Hey everybody, thank you so much for watching Leaf by Leaf as always. It is wonderful to be back with you back in front of the camera after this summer sabbatical. Thank you all so much for all of the amazing compliments and kudos and warm feelings and so on that you gave me when I announced that I would do this summer sabbatical. Thank you all so much for being so gracious and complimentary of my amazing time with the David Foster Wallace conference. I hope uh, you enjoyed seeing the video from that talk. There was so much more that happened, including spending so many months of this year um, unexpectedly immersed in David Foster Wallace's writing. I reread almost everything he wrote. I reread all of the fiction and all of the essays. I only skipped a few things like signifying rappers and everything and more. Um, which I had read previously, but didn't uh, have time to include leading up to the conference. But that was how I spent a good chunk of the year and all the way up through the end of June. But I spent an even greater portion of my summer, pretty much right after I got back from Gettysburg up to, well, now, completely immersed in 10th century Heian, Japan. I was reading the Tale of Genji by Murasaki Shikibu. Incredible, incredible monument of world literature. I was thinking about what to do with this video because I'm recording this and, and I've been planning it under the presumption that most of the people watching this video haven't read the book. Maybe have not even heard of the book, but I'm assuming you've at least heard of it, just based on what I know uh, of the people who watch this channel. And so what I want to do is I want to try and approach this video in a way to where that's my target audience. What I will say, however, is that there is definitely going to be another video about the tale of Genji. I want to read this in a different translation in maybe a year or two, and I will do a video where I go much, much deeper throughout everything. Nonetheless, I'm going to try to cater uh, to everybody as much as I can and give you a really broad uh, sweep and dipping in uh, here and there to some key scenes and some uh, key moments and, and concepts in the book. Uh, but this is probably going to be much more on the aesthetics of the book than getting really, really, really down into the weeds, which I'll save for a second video. And so here at the start, I want to talk about some things that a lot of you express interest in 
here and there uh, across these videos and different posts on social media. And that would be how I came to hear of the book. A lot of people ask me, how do you find these books, you know, that you go and read? Why did you choose to read it? Of course, why the Tyler translation, the Royal Tyler translation, we'll get to that in a whole section of this video on translation, and also uh, note-taking and the logistics of reading, meaning how long did it take me to read it? What was my average reading pace? How did I sort of schedule or plan to read this massive tome, or was it much more just sort of whimsical? And again, note-taking, you know, what are all these colored tabs for? What, what do you actually write in your book? I get these questions so often that I figure I'd include them here in this video. And I won't harp on it too long because, of course, the main intention of this video is to draw your attention to this amazing masterpiece that deserves to be in your hands. How did I come to learn of this book? Well, I can trace it back directly to Michael Durda's 1996, I think, essay in the Washington Post called Hey on Holiday, and it was collected in one of his books that I was reading, or maybe, I don't know how I came across it, but in any case, it was definitely his essay, Hey on Holiday, and he was talking about this book from Hey on Japan by Murasaki Shikibu, and he painted a picture beyond, of course, just the book itself, but he painted a picture that really connected with my bookworm heart because he talked about how the Post gave him a four-week sabbatical where he got to go by himself and live on the prestigious campus of Duke University. And for four weeks, he taught some classes here and there, but for the better part, he spent his days reading this book, The Tale of Genji, that he had known about for a long time, but it's so massive, and since he, you know, lives the life of a newspaper reviewer, there's not really time to stop and really read a 1,000-page book and really, you know, spend time in its presence as it demands, but he just set this up so beautifully where he's, you know, on this Duke University campus, and he's waking up and putting in some hours in the book and teaching a class here and there, putting in more hours, uh, listening to classical music and drinking hot tea in this apartment. And because of all that, it really made the title stick with me. Because of course, the whole time I'm reading it, he's got me living vicariously through him and just imagining, fantasizing about being him and getting to do that. Most likely at the time, I had my own book in mind that I had been putting off for a long time. You know, one of those massive tomes sitting on your shelves that you haven't gotten to yet. You know you need to, you know it's important, but it's just like it never calls to you in a way that you respond to like, oh yeah, it's time. It's more like, man, when am I ever going to read that? And so I acquired the book. Uh, around the time that I read that essay, but like I just described, it's sort of sort of been shaming me from my shelves ever since. And I have had those thoughts along the way of when will I ever get to this? So that was how it got put on my radar. So I come to these books by reading essays, articles, reviews from people like Michael Durda. Then the second place it showed up was in the updated lifetime reading plan that was originally set forth by the great Clifton Fadiman, but then updated as the new lifetime reading plan by John S. Major. And he really dipped into the Middle Eastern and Far Eastern canons to cull out and supplement the Western-centric canon that Fadiman set out. And of course, Tale of Genji is in there. So that was the second time. Then the third time was with the great Stephen Moore's excellent two-volume alternative history of the novel, where he really, in, in the way that he does, really makes a case in about 10 pages of why not reading the tale of Genji leaves a serious deficit in your cultural knowledge as a person and in your just being able to have those beautiful aesthetic 
experiences that a book like this provides. So that was sort of with, you know, Derda, then John S. Major, then Stephen Moore, you know, this is more and more <laughs> tipping me uh, to say, yeah, it's, it's about time to read this book. Well, then finally, because of a subscriber on this channel named Dylan McNeil, who is a translator of Japanese into English, who lives in Toronto. He commented on one of my videos talking about, hey, listen, man, I, I think you'd really love the tale of Genji. And then we connected an email and little by little, fast forward, he was the absolute tipping point. And we jumped into this thing together. And I don't really ever do, you know, the so-called buddy read. And just my reading habits are so sometimes erratic and idiosyncratic that I kind of want to spare people that <laughs> by not trying to, to align. But this was just an incredible experience. So a lot of this video will be indebted to Dylan, whose knowledge of Japanese, the language, classical Japanese and modern Japanese, uh, the tale of Genji in particular. He is a big fan of Mishima and Kobo Abe, and he, he literally spent time on uh, Google Meets with me, helping me work on my pronunciation and just filling in a lot of stuff. And it's amazing because we ended up corresponding with one another through email throughout the reading of the of this book. And we ended up with over 300 pages of correspondence, pretty much, I'd say about 99% focused deeply on the book. And then 1% our personalities started coming out and we had a lot of great fun. So that's how I came to know about it and finally was compelled to read it. Now I'll talk a little bit about those logistics. I started reading it on July 3rd and I finished reading it on August 8th. My average pace was two hours a day. I roughly blocked off two hours every evening and read in a very focused manner with uh, silence around me. Um, this book. There was, however, one day in that period that I missed, and I, I just couldn't get around to reading it all that day. There are 54 chapters, chapters 1 through 33, and a lot of scholars have divided it into three parts. There's the first part, then the second part, and then the, the final part. And we'll talk more about that as the video rolls on. But chapters 1 through 33 were such that I was able to read about two chapters a day with that roughly two hours a day. And then chapters 34 and 35 are the Wakana 1 and Wakana 2, or Spring Shoots 1 and 2. They're the longest chapters in the book, and a lot happens, and you have to pay pretty close attention. Those I had to spend a whole weekend reading. So I spent a, a whole Friday, Saturday, and Sunday reading just 34 and 35. Then for chapters 36 through 44, I was able to go back to about two a day, and then finally, uh, that last section, chapters 45 through 54, I read those at a pace of one chapter a day. And that was because, yes, the chapters were a little longer, uh, the style and the tone changes a bit, but as we'll hear uh, coming up, a lot of people have referred to those final sections, the so-called Uji chapters, because they're set in a place, Uji, near the Uji River, um, a lot of people have cited that as the absolute best parts of the book. And in that way, Shikibu sort of saves the best for last, but it only has the, that impact and that thrust and that power from having read the first uh, two parts of the book. But in any case, I read those at one chapter a day also because they were just so good and I wanted to just savor them a chapter at a time. There were two chapters that I had to reread. As I'll talk about here and there, the book does demand very close attention, and we'll get into that, but you'll need to really follow what's going on, which character is talking. Because of the way that it's written and the audience for whom it was originally intended, it can be very ambiguous. You know, you'll need to really follow, you know, what illicit affair caused this to actually be this person's son versus the person that they think, everybody thinks is the father, different things like that. But 
Yeah, in all, I think that especially with the Tyler translation and his extremely uh, helpful footnotes and his list of characters at the beginning of each chapter, it is absolutely doable. And especially for someone, probably the reader who is actually interested in reading uh, The Tale of Genji, I'm, I'm certain that you're qualified enough to grab this edition and be okay. But all that to say that you know, it's an all-encompassing book. I did read it exclusively, meaning I didn't read anything else at the time that I was reading it. Then I went to the beach for my birthday for a few days, and it was so crazy because while I was there, I felt this deep and very real sense of loss. I had spent so much time immersed in this world that Chikibu paints for us, and it had drawn me in so deeply and become such a part of my life and and as I'll discuss it just touched me on so many levels that suddenly I felt kind of lost like this stranger in a strange land wandering around on uh, a beach in North Carolina in the 21st century all of a sudden but then I got back and I read Genji Days by Edward G Seidensticker and this book was is a selection from a diary that the great translator uh, Seiden Sticker, who has translated Kawabata, Mishima, and of course, uh, The Tale of Genji, he kept this diary during the decade or so that he was translating it. And the, I think the full thing got translated in Japan. He was a very, very well-known figure there. And uh, we have a selection available to us in English. And it turned out to be quite a journey and quite a treat. And I'll just be reading selections from it later, but... As I quickly found, uh, Edward G. Seidensicker is quite the character, but it was a great digestif following the book itself. Then I actually took a few days to finally write a review and submit it to Rain Taxi for Matt Booker's debut novel called The Beelin Deck. I had the privilege of listen to, listening to him read the first bits of it in a cafe there in Gettysburg during the David Foster Wallace conference and immediately snagged my attention. Um, I read it, loved it, read it again, wrote a review. It's submitted. We'll see what happens. But lovely, lovely book. Then after that, I read The Bridge of Dreams by Hasuo Shirane. And I have to say, this is one of the most exemplary works of literary criticism literary exegesis, really, uh, just scholarship in general. This is one of the best examples of academic writing scholarship done right. I would not recommend it if you haven't read The Tale of Genji, but if you have or are planning to, you will absolutely want Shirane's book, and we'll get into excerpts from that later. And then finally, I read excerpts uh, the, the chapter from Seeds in the Heart by Donald Keene, his great anthology of Japanese literature. I read the chapter on the tale of Genji. I went back and reread the sections on Genji from Stephen Moore's book. And then I read a couple of articles from Dylan McNeil, the Toronto-based translator uh, with whom I was corresponding this whole time. And he just really in, enlightened me on so many things, and, and he's responsible for giving us some concrete information about the uh, translation I chose. So then we get into a little bit about note-taking. So you'll notice all of my tabs, they're all different colors. What I do is, as I start reading a book like this, as I start noticing things that pop out at me or that make me think or that really just catch my attention in some way, I'll quickly try to think of a category and I'll just start tabbing it with a color and let that color represent that category. And then I keep a tab. I literally, on the title page, write out a tab key. And so for the tale of Genji, it worked out like this. Blue tabs would be translator info. So this was footnotes, his introduction, things like that. Just things that were given to me from the translator that were noteworthy. Yellow is historical context, insight into Heian, Japan. Green is just good writing, and this is, this is what I like more than anything else in a book. And, and so green indicates just the writing was really struck me, and it was beautiful, or 
clever in some way. Orange was a striking idea or something that hit me on a level to where I knew I wanted to spend lots of time thinking about that, but I didn't want to get snagged on it. I wanted to keep reading the book because of course it's good to when you're, especially the first time you're reading something, don't harp on something for forever and get snagged on it. I mean, I'm just giving you, I'm just telling you my opinion. You can do whatever you want. And sometimes maybe it calls for getting snagged on something for a while. But often what I do, especially with a book of this size, if something pops up and I'm like, oh, that's a really interesting idea. I want to think about that. I'll mark it and maybe write out a little question or something and I'll tab it. And I know that it's probably going to be touched on again and again as the book goes on. And so I want the book to shape my thoughts about it more than the other way around. Red indicates a poem that I really loved, and there's almost 800 poems in this novel, by the way. Purple indicates something that was particular to the character Genji, and lime, <laughs> lime green. I started running out of colors, so I had to go from green to lime green. Uh, indicates some humor, and most of the humor comes from the narrator. Uh, and she just gets so cheeky uh, it's and self-referential. It's hilarious. And so in addition to that, that's sort of the main thing that happens. And then I'll just write little notes. Uh, so for example, I've got one here that's tabbed as both blue and green, which indicates there's something that the translator has given me and there's something that I love about the writing. And it was the writing... Uh, specifically within these letters, these poems. And this was sort of the primary means of communication during the day amongst learned and noble people is through poems. So the, your poem can say everything about you. Um, and as we'll get to in a little bit, it was much more than just the writing, the paper you chose, the uh, scent you chose to, to actually give the paper a smell. Uh, you might have a sprig of some plant uh, that the, the the missive was tied to. But in, in any case, as I was uh, underlining this, I also like to mark in the margins just a little note about why. Even if I can't fully represent it in my mind at the time or articulate it, I'll just put a little note. So I underline this and it looks like uh, my note says every element of these missives matter or matters. And so that is good to do because at the time when I'm underlining it, I may know why I'm doing that. But of course, after reading a 1200 page book and going back, I may not quite understand just from the bit that was underlined, you know, why exactly I did that. So it's more of like a memory cue or something like that. Here's a good example. On this page, I underlined what says, he will soon begin his 50th year. She might offer him the new spring shoots. And... Just reading that without looking at my little note in the margin, I kind of know what that's talking about. I know that this is from the two spring shoots, the two Wakana uh, chapters, and I know that one was about Genji and one was about uh, the emperor who was about to retire or was retired. So even that's a little hazy. But luckily, I wrote this note. Just as Tamakazura gave Genji the spring shoots for his 40th, here, Ono san no Miya, will do the same for her father's 50th. And so now I remember, oh, that's right. This is a total parallel with uh, two different women and two different men. And they mirror each other. One was for Genji's 40th and one was for um, Onasan no Miya's father's 50th. Also on the title page, I'll keep little lists of things. So for this one, I kept lists of food, clothing, musical modes, instruments, flowers because these things are so prominent and I'll take little notes um, just that stand out such as for example Omi no Kimi really is a character that reminded me of Natasha from War and Peace. She's just so vibrant and energetic and um, her energy just sort of like bulldozes over all of the customs and mores and manners, and you just can't help but love her. And then I've got the late Kashiwagi as Raskolnikov, and the way that the guilt of one of the characters in here after a huge transgression, transgression is depicted really reminded me of the way that Dostoevsky depicts that psychological 
turmoil that starts to manifest physically for Raskolnikov. And then I'll write funny things like challenge, find a book with more crying than this one. I wrote out a list of analogs for Western-minded readers. I wrote change in really big letters with circles around it because this is sort of the primary theme or whatever of the book. And it may be not change so much as impermanence. And again, like I said, I did this as a sort of buddy read with Dylan. And what I would do is my reading from each night, I would then organize in an email the next morning and send that off. And then he would make some annotations and respond. And then I would make some annotations. And sometimes we'd go back and forth. And in that way, it really helped to reinforce and think through a lot of what I was reading instead of just reading it in isolation and taking all my notes and then sitting with them all in one big clump at the end. It was sort of a cool uh, process of many iterations, many and many iterations. Our correspondence also led us to put together a list of things that the tale of Genji antecedes, and the list may be sort of shocking. The Tale of Genji anticipates French New Wave cinema, The Recognitions, Hamlet, Proust, Ulysses, the intertextuality of modernism, and the self-referentialism of postmodernism, Gertrude Stein, Romance Paperbacks, Fog and Mist as Character, just as we find in Charles Dickens's Bleak House, Naturalism, Freud's Uncanny and Jung's Shadow Theory, and Tristram Shandy. And I won't reveal why most conspicuously, but that's also one of the pleasures of using the Royal Tyler translation. Now, I don't usually care to go into plot summaries in my videos because I'm not so concerned with plot in most of the books I read, and I feel like it's sort of superfluous or wasteful or redundant for me to go into a plot summary when you can seek out so many other sources, including the back of the book. I actually like to go in cold, just as I did with Tale of Genji. I don't, I know of its notability and I know little things about it, but I don't need a plot summary to entice me at that point. Nonetheless, I do feel that for this video, a certain level of plot summary will be necessary as we start to go deeper into the book and into things written about the book so that you at least have a little bit of an idea of what we're talking about. And what I did was I gave myself the constraint that my plot summary had to fit on a single Word document page. And so here's what I came up with. And by the way, Shirane, Hatsuo Shirane from The Bridge of Dreams also made the point that in a work of this kind, it is misleading to speak of the text in terms of plot or theme, and I agree with him. So take that with you as your grain of salt as I go into this. Set in 10th century Japan, a few generations before the time of Murasaki Shikibu's writing, the tale of Genji follows its titular character throughout the fullest spectrum of a human life, enmeshed in a web of political, social, and sexual escapades, capers, and foibles tracing out a sweeping arc of lives, loves, and loss, and ultimately becoming both a dithyram to desire and a panegyric to passion. In this regard, Genji becomes a theater of both Dionysus and Apollo in the terms Nietzsche sets out in The Birth of Tragedy. Genji, though, isn't his actual name. None of the characters have proper names. Instead, Genji here refers to his title as a member of the Minamoto, one of the major clans of the time. With this status, he was effectively excluded from the imperial line of succession, but maintained high rank among the nobility nonetheless. This demotion from his father, the emperor, can seem like a dishonor, but it's actually a shrewd decision born out of prudence and political acuity, effectively blocking imperial usurpation by the rivaling Fujiwara clan. But it's also a move that will have many repercussions and meanings throughout the novel. This dual status is a sort of commoner and noble. Compounded with the fact of his being the rightful heir to the throne, puts Genji in a unique position that lends itself to a highly entertaining, morally complicated, and ultimately endearing hero of the highest literary merits.
The social drama of the novel, though engrossing, is second to the psychological drama for which the tale of Genji is most famous. The seeds for this dimension of the tale are found in Genji's mother, Kiritsubo, a low-ranking woman who died when Genji was very young, just as Murasaki Shikibu's own mother did. When his father marries the young and beautiful Fujisubo, Genji hears people mention how much she resembles his actual mother, which arouses a potent mix of emotions that is played out to great effect and complexity throughout his life and beyond. From these fraught beginnings, we follow Genji, whose presence is so glorious it literally shines. From his earliest feelings for his stepmother, to his politically arranged and passionless marriage, to his insatiable and, well, peculiar philandering, notably almost always with low-ranking women, just like his biological mother, to his main love, Murasaki, to his mellowing years, to his desire to end his days as a monk, a common aspiration for the end of life at the time. In the final chapters of the book, which are regularly cited as the best parts of the tale, we follow the plights and perils of a handful of characters down the generational line from Genji. In fact, as Hatsuo Shirane masterfully demonstrates, Murasaki Shikibu splits Genji in half, channeling his Dionysian side into one character and his Apollonian side into another. The serious and gentlemanly Kaoru longs to seek enlightenment from a wise man in the hills, but instead becomes infatuated with the wise man's eldest daughter. Kaoru's friend, the swaggering Lothario Nio, seizes the opportunity to delight in the wise man's youngest daughter. But when both young men come into contact with an unknown half-sister, we witness the fullest and most dramatic expression of all the characters' desires and actions across the cast of the entire novel. It is here that we see how every flap of a butterfly's wings accumulates, repeats, and evolves through time. The sentiments of Western readers will respond to the Shakespearean social dramatics, the Proustian poetics of memory and jealousy, and the biblical exasperation with the vanity and impermanence of life, all synthesized on a Tolstoyan scale. In the end, though, the tale of Genji surmounts both the Western and the Eastern canons and joins ranks with the masterpieces of world literature. So let's talk about translation. I, again, chose the Royal Tyler translation in this gorgeous, beautifully produced and designed Penguin Deluxe paperback. I cannot tell you how pleasurable it is to read this. This is completely unabridged. It's got the deckled edge pages. It's complete with maps and indexes, uh, character overviews. It's got very well-balanced footnotes, and the pages are adorned with illustrations all throughout the text. But like I said earlier, I'm indebted to Dylan McNeil for helping me decide which translation. You see, I don't know Japanese, and I certainly don't know classical Japanese. And so it would be sort of fraudulent for me to sit here and extol the merits of reading the Tyler just because I read the Tyler. And so we're going to look at someone who actually took time to research out the four English translations that we have. Whaley, Seiden Sticker, Tyler, and most recently Washburn. And even really zoom in on key moments and compare against the classical Japanese and then even modern Japanese and see which one has the best merits. And the best part about it was Dylan is most interested in two things above all, fidelity to the original and beautiful writing. And I would have to agree on both of those counts. Everything I'm about to read about the translation is taken from an article he wrote on his LinkedIn profile. He is a professional uh, linguist and translator. I'll put the link to this in the description. But he tells us the very first complete translation into English was accomplished by author Whaley published in six volumes from 1925 to 1933, a truly remarkable achievement for its time. And uh, side note here, in a footnote in Stephen Moore's book, Stephen Moore talks about how he loves the Tyler translation. That's the one he used. That's the one he read. And he did comment, as many people do, and as you're about to hear, on how much liberty Whaley took 
and but more also footnotes that Michael Durda, uh, you can see these linkages and synchronicities here. Michael Durda reminded him that we shouldn't be too harsh on Whaley because after all, Whaley is the one who introduced this classic to the West. Nonetheless, I'll continue. My research revealed that it contains numerous errors and omissions, which definitely wouldn't fly in my realm of translation, most notably the absence of an entire chapter. The second translation was undertaken by Edward Seidensticker, published in 1976. Seidensticker aimed to make up for Whaley's shortcomings by hewing more closely to the original, but takes a far more cutting and direct approach, including the use of nicknames for all the characters. Calling people directly by name was deeply inappropriate in Heian, Japan, so the characters are refer referred to in the original by their rank relationship to one another or palace of residence. And Seidensticker sacrificed some of the poetic flavor of Murasaki's prose. And one of the things that we talked about in our emails back and forth, Dylan made a, a good comment saying that Seidensticker felt masculine and cold, whereas Tyler's is feminine and warm. And uh, I agree with that from what I've read. The third translation was published by Royal Tyler in 2001. Tyler's approach was to be as faithful to the source text as possible. Long and flowing sentences in the, in the original are retained in English. Yes, bring it on. The characters are referred to as they are in the Japanese. And there's a helpful list of persons at the beginning of each chapter. You will need those. And Thank you, Tyler, for those. And very extensive footnotes are used to explain all the allusions and cultural details throughout. The balance of footnotes it was incredible because I don't think there was a single page that had more than maybe an inch's worth of footnotes at the bottom of it. They are in line. They are not in the back of the text. They're in line. So you can glance down and back up, do the, the deer dip <laughs> on your page. Uh, but, I mean, his... I can't say enough about the footnotes, how incredibly helpful and often very interesting they are. The fourth and most recent translation was completed by Dennis Washburn in 2015. In the aim of a more approachable translation, Washburn refer reverts back to the nicknames used by Seidensticker and explains much of what was left unsaid in the original right within the translation itself. It's over 200 pages longer than Tyler's as a result. His Prose also frequently employs modern colloquialisms to achieve a more contemporary, easily digestible style. So if, I will say this, if you really just want to read this book and enjoy the story with as little interruption as possible, at the sacrifice of some of the more poetic beauty, and you're okay with about 200 more pages of reading, Washburn would probably be the best way to go and in terms of just ease, total ease. But I will say that having read the Tyler and of everything I know, um, Tyler's is the best overall experience. As Dylan says, beauty of prose exceeds, exceeds most other considerations for me. And I very much appreciate Tyler's aim of rendering the original text in as faithful and fluid a manner as possible. The overall effect is pleasingly gauzy and perfumed. I love those two adjectives that uh, Dylan came up with to describe this prose. Just the whole book is gauzy and perfumed. We'll get more into that later. One added bonus of the Tyler translation, which I personally appreciate, is that Tyler made the extra effort of maintaining syllabic fidelity in the nearly 800 tanka, that is five line, five line poems of 57577 syllables, found in the novel with footnoted explanations of the wordplay contained in the originals. Bravo indeed. Then he takes a sampling of the prose and puts them all together and, and contrasts them, and he comes out with this. The first and most obvious difference between the four translation is their lengths. A standard rule of thumb for technical Japanese to English translation is that two Japanese characters will roughly equate to one English word. This is where I'm so in debt to someone with this kind of knowledge. The original classical Japanese excerpt from the sample is 482 characters long, and the modern Japanese version I've been referencing is composed of 583 characters. And by the way, most Japanese read in a modern Japanese 
translation. It's sort of like uh, Beowulf or uh, Canterbury Tales for us today. This would suggest that the English translation should be somewhere between 240 and 290 English words. Whaley's and Tyler's fall right around this range, while Seiden Sticker's version is shorter and Washburn's is severely distended to over 400 words. He then zooms in on this one particular sentence. And from this sentence, he says, I find this sentence particularly interesting. Whaley, in the 1920s, felt the need to change the Go game to chess, one of many alterations he made to westernize the text, something he probably felt necessary for his contemporary audience. Two of the other three translations have overtly sexualized her, or the, the female character's appearance. I think it's Tamakazura, but I could be wrong. While Tyler's is much more subdued. The original classical Japanese phrasing, and then there's classical Japanese characters that I have no idea how to pronounce, suggest disheveled or unkempt, or possibly even slovenly, but is decidedly non-sexual. To me, this is yet another point in Tyler's favor. Ultimately, then, both Seiden Stickers and Tyler's translations are closer to the original than the other two, with Tyler's flow and phrasing much more appealing to my sensibilities. So a way of summing all that up and pulling from things that I read in Seiden Stickers' Genji days, the Whaley very much sought to appeal to Western sentiment without bothering us with all of the uh, original Eastern flavor, going so far as to even change the game uh, that they're playing Go to playing chess. And in Seiden Stickers' view, Whaley embroidered quite a bit. And I love that word because he just, I think Moore said that he basically produced a, an Edwardian novel. Nonetheless, perhaps reading Whaley, I've heard that the prose is beautiful. That's the version that actually Michael Dura read in the essay Heian days. And I've heard that it's beautiful in its own right, though Seidensticker does say at one point in his journal that he's not so sure it's all that beautiful. The analogy that's in my mind is that reading Whaley may be tantamount to maybe reading the KJV Bible versus reading an ESV or NASB translation, um, which those would be more in tune with Seidensticker, who's a little more cold and cutting and gets rid of all the embroidery and flowering that uh, Whaley added. And then Washburn, I guess one way I think about it is instead of having footnotes, he sort of comes up with his own prose and adds that in on top of Shikibu to uh, sort of make like the footnotes built in. I guess we could think about it. So overall, I'm just, I'm definitely uh, in favor of Tyler. However, I do want to read this again. And when I do, it will most likely be in the Seiden sticker translation. Now what I want to do is a section that I'm calling excerpts from experts. And we'll just go through a lot of secondary literature to see what they have to say about the tale of Genji. From the new lifetime reading plan, John S. Major says, Few people would argue with the assertion that the tale of Genji is Japan's greatest work of literature. Some literary historians describe it as the world's first psychological novel. Many critics regard it as one of the half dozen or so finest novels in world literature. The whole atmosphere of Genji is suffused with beauty and refinement, but also with a sense of sadness and impending loss a feeling that beauty is all the more beautiful for one's realization that it will soon fade. And that is a beautiful way of describing it. From 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, James Mustich says, The book seems to encompass in its thousand pages a history of the form as it would unfold in the future. Beginning in a fairy tale realm, its storytelling passes through uninhabited countries on the continent of fiction that will not be settled for several centuries. It ventures through the romance and the picaresque to discover the domestic, social, and psychological novel before any of these would be imagined by another writer. In the Norton Anthology of World Literature, it says that although originally written for a narrow circle of court aristocrats in Kyoto, the tale of Genji had unparalleled success in engaging generations of passionate readers and it is now uniquely representative of Japanese literature. It celebrates the power of poetry, music, and dance to shape society and give depth to human life. 
In Heian, Japan, men and women were strictly segregated and women's lives were extremely circumscribed. The role of a lady was to marry and bear, bear children. And if she came from a suitably good family, she was apt to find herself a pawn in a, the marriage politics of the imperial court. A noble woman's days were spent behind curtains and screens, hidden from the world or from the male world. A man's first marriage often took place when he was still a boy of 12 or 13. Women were even a year or two younger. Because of the ages of the spouses and the likelihood of the first marriage in particular being a political and economic arrangement, both husband and wife tended eventually to seek love elsewhere, although only men could have multiple marriage partners. And that's a very key information for a lot of the drama in this novel. Genji, the character, is charismatic, irresistible, and tantalizingly flawed. Charming and handsome, brilliant and ardent, rakish but faithful in his own way. Unlike other men, he never abandons any woman he has loved. He is an extraordinary literary figure. Until the early modern period, readers studied the tale of Genji to enhance their skills in poetry composition. The tale of Genji became the subject of erudite scholastic commentaries. It inspired screen paintings and illustrated hand scrolls, no and puppet plays, poetry handbooks, parodies, and more recently, woodblock prints, films, and manga versions. From Harold Bloom's Genius, Coming in at number 35 of 100, Lady Murasaki. Lady Murasaki, in her diary, as in the tale of Genji, conducts an almost Proustian search for lost time, which is appropriate in a writer who truly was the genius of longing. Lady Murasaki's own splendor, like Proust's, is her gathering wisdom, in which a mingled spiritual and aesthetic nostalgia takes the place of a waning social order. To be a genius of longing, you must excel in narrative patience, and it is astonishing how well she varies her stories. Lady Murasaki, more than 900 years before Freud, understood that all erotic transferences were substitute formations for earlier attachments. The book became, and still is, a kind of secular Bible for Japanese culture. What Don Quixote almost uniquely was to Miguel de Unamuno, the tale of Genji has been for a myriad of Japanese men and women of, of aesthetic sensibility. After reading Lady Murasaki, you never feel the same again about loving or falling in love. And that is very true. From Stephen Moore's alternative history of the novel, the tale of Genji, circa 1010, is when we believe it was roughly penned, would be an extraordinary novel in any time or place, but all the more so for appearing in the 11th century and in Japan. As we've seen earlier in his history, Japanese fiction was only a century old when Genji was written and consisted mostly of compact stylized works of considerable surface charm, but of little depth. How then to account for the quantum leap to this elegantly erudite, psychologically profound, thousand-page tragic comedy of manners. Genius, suggests Harold Bloom. He includes the author in his book of that name, calling her the genius of longing. And in the absence of any other explanation, it's hard to disagree. Murasaki relies on understatement, indirection, suggestion, a coded language made up of poetic allusions and a complex pattern of floral and seasonal Im imagery to relate her tale. The modern reader doesn't so much listen to the story as eavesdrop on it, spy on it, like the courtiers in Genji always peeking through gaps and peepholes to catch glimpses of the young beauties indoors. The reader of Genji is not an invited guest, but a voyeur. That is, a, Moore always comes up with these great sentences, and that imputes so much to us because again, like we read earlier, this was written in a very specific time and for a very specific audience. But because of Murasaki Shikibu's genius, she touched something universal. And that's why it still resonates even with someone like me on a very profound level today. The Tale of Genji is primarily a mordant expose of the nature of desire. If Freud had had access to this novel, Genji, 
would be as iconic as Oedipus in psychology. <laughs> Say what you will about their unorthodox relationship, meaning the unorthodox relationship between Genji and the much, much younger Murasaki in the novel, whom he takes as something like a 10-year-old girl as his daughter, but raises her up ultimately to be a wife. Say what you will, though, about their unorthodox relationship. Some will be reminded of Lolita or Tandy in Winesburg, Ohio, but with happy endings. Others of Pygmalion or tabloid-grade pedophilia. Genji and Violet, as Murasaki implies the color Violet, are one of the most fascinating, psychologically complex couples in world literature. And this couldn't be truer. If Murasaki's understanding of sexual pathology sounds remarkably modern, her attitude toward fiction sounds positively postmodern. Reviewing the first volume of Whaley's translation in Vogue in the summer of 1925, Virginia Woolf was gobsmacked, well, impressed by the novel, but predicted the Lady Murasaki is not going to prove herself the peer of Tolstoy and Cervantes or those other great storytellers of the Western world. She, meaning Wolf, was wrong. The tale of Genji can hold its own with War and Peace, Don Quixote, or any other novel produced by Western novelists. From Side and Sticker's Genji Days, how much finer a day than ours, meaning a day that he's writing about or translating uh, from the novel. That day able to see beauty in old age and make of it for artistic purposes, something other than a butt of derision and a source of revulsion. How sadly lacking in our baby-directed culture is literature that takes old age seriously and sees that it has the melancholy advantage of being able to look back over it all. This is great. He notes that, In the morning I went back to the Genji, became so absorbed in it, indeed, that I quite forgot an appointment with my friendly dentist. I'm telling you, the, the personality that comes through is, uh, in some respects, very off-putting. Uh, but in many respects, just, well, just a character. I have to say again, I was hit with many, many different unexpected surprises reading this book. It became uh, actually very entertaining, uh, more so than just insight into translating Genji. I suppose much that I like about Yokobue has to do with the fact that so large a part of it is seen from an entirely masculine point of view. What an un-Japanese faculty for standing outside herself our author did have. And Dylan and I both noted this, and it's been noted elsewhere as well, but I was extremely blown away of how Shikibu, writing as a woman and for women, was able to depict points of view that totally went against her own, and often provide them in a way to where she, you could tell she had taken on the identity of that character. I mean, really, the stuff of first-rate novelists. And that leads him to say how very modern our Murasaki is. The process left me feeling once again, and I think that it has been the dominant feeling over the years, that it stands at the beginning rather than at the end of something. An altogether drier, more laconic story should follow, and that it does not is, once again, a strong argument for the theory of single authorship. Only Murasaki herself had come far enough to be up to it, and when she faltered, there was, as with Genji, no one to take her place. And so more and more from uh, Keen, from Seidensticker, and from Tyler and Shirane, there's, there are strong arguments that the entire book that we have, The Tale of Genji, was all written uh, by Murasaki, though, although it has been contested and still is contested uh, that some chapters were not written by her, that later editors and copyists did much embroidering as Whaley did, or that the final chapters, the Uji chapters, were actually written by a successor, most favorably for those proponents, Murasaki Shikibu's daughter. And yet, how very different is Murasaki's story from anything in the Ise, meaning the uh, Ise Monogatari. Her narrative, Murasaki's, has flesh and blood. It is as if she were writing a story, the plot for which the author or authors of the Ise had but sketched in. 
he avers or they aver, she demonstrates. Our Murasaki is finding her stride. She must have been young when she wrote it, and yet in terms of what might be called understanding of the weaknesses and foibles of the human race, it, the tale of Genji, is next to miraculous. Murasaki may be considered a pessimist, and indeed commonly is by the Japanese, for her views on the decline of Buddhism, and, by implication at least, the decay of the court aristocracy. But she is an optimist in her view of human nature. So much is said about Murasaki the psychologist and Murasaki the social critic that a person tends to forget the most important Murasaki, the spinner of good yarns. One sees the contrast in the treatment of women. The Heiki woman, meaning the tale of Heiki, enjoys being knocked down and trampled on, sheds happy tears, and will do almost anything to keep pure the image of patient suffering. While Murasaki Shikibu takes the more realistic view that a helpless woman is in a pretty sad position and cannot be expected to enjoy it. It has very long been the case that the things which seem to the Japanese most Japanese have been foggy, inchoate things, and not clear, sparkling things. One of the messages in the whole huge story might be that sorrow ennobles. Dostoevsky broods over the meaning of life, and Tolstoy over the meaning of history, and Dickens over pretense and social injustice. And each of these is a liberty which we permit only to the novelist who has done the important thing first, filled his pages with life. Now we are to permit Murasaki her thing, for which she too has done her work well. Hers is yet another thing again, and something else too, perhaps, from the transcendental generalizations which the learned commentator, commentators have her making. No doubt she is concerned with Buddhist truths, but she is more concerned to crystallize the moment in the flow of nature, make it be still. In this, Basho is like her, and Kawabata. What is most striking about these pages, among the most famous in the whole long tale, is that they are what a novel should be, impartial. A feminine bias is present, of course, in the selection of the material, in the decision that the little princess is to be completely innocent and that Genji is to be a self-righteous prig. But the details selected for presentation are then presented in such a manner that we must accept them. They become facts, not interpretations or judgments. This is from Donald Keene's Seeds in the Heart. Genji Monogatari, the tale of Genji, is considered to be the supreme masterpiece of Japanese literature. Kawabata Yasunari, once wrote that it was impossible to understand the culture of the Muromachi period, though it is often discussed by historians in terms of turbulent forces from below overthrowing the traditional authorities, without a knowledge of the extraordinary influence this supreme product of the aristocratic culture continued to exert. At the time of the greatest crisis in modern Japan, the wartime bombings and the defeat, Kawabata turned to the tale of Genji for reassurance and comfort. The tale of Genji is not only the quintessence of the aristocratic culture of Heian Japan, but has affected the aesthetic and emotional life of the entire Japanese people for a millennium. Modifications of the text unquestionably occurred, as we can infer from the numerous variants. But for most purposes, it can be assumed that Murasaki Shikibu wrote the entire work. The novel ends in a manner that may strike readers as inconclusive, but it has never occurred to Japanese scholars that the novel may be unfinished. Murasaki Shikibu took leave of her world in the manner of the painters of horizontal scrolls who, after depicting scenes crowded with people, show at the end one last haunting figure disappearing into the dark. The expressive genius of the Yamato language, Japanese before it was greatly affected by Chinese influence, is nowhere better displayed than in the prose and poetry of the tale of Genji. And this is why Genji is routinely cited as our great view into daily life during that time in Heian, Japan. Murasaki Shikibu indicates that writing the tale of Genji resulted from the compulsion that authors feel to record events that have so deeply moved them that they cannot bear to think that a time might come when they would be forgotten. Keane says that the Uji chapters, that final stretch of chapters, are literally the best part of the tale of Genji. It occupies in Japanese literature the place of Shakespeare in English literature, of Dante 
in Italian literature or of Cervantes in Spanish literature. It is also a monument of world literature, the first novel of magnitude composed anywhere, a work that is at once distinctively Japanese and universally affecting. And finally, from The Bridge of Dreams by Hatsuo Shirane. When the Genji was finally recognized in the early Kamakura period as literature of the highest order, it was appreciated not as prose fiction per se, but for its waka, or poetic passages. Like the Genji, the earliest monogatari focus on the subject of love, but none of them dwells, as the Genji does, on bereavement, aisho, and separation, ribetsu. To the reader unfamiliar with the narrative tradition, the Genji monogatari may appear to be the product of Murasaki Shikibu's imagination, or the results of a realistic impulse to record her observations and experiences. But the author employed plot conventions which were already known to her audience and which they no doubt expected her to use. And one thing this book does so well is it shows you, really shows you what Shikibu was doing to sort of stand out and dazzle the readers of her time. And it's just, again, it, it's the top-notch novelist that was already there within her. Julia Kristeva has argued that every text takes shape as a mo mosaic of citations. Every text is the absorption and transformation of other texts. Nowhere is this more true than in the Summa chapter, which alludes to, cites, and draws upon a wide range of Chinese poetry, waka, monogatari, and other literary texts. Though many of these allusions are little more than borrowed phrases, a significant number, as the medieval commentaries on the tale of Genji reveal, play upon the images, situations, and tonality of other works. The result is a delicate verbal weave, a pluralistic text that invites disparate and often conflicting interpretations. The Genji is written in a highly colloquial style, as if the narrator were speaking directly to an intimate audience. Indeed, one of the remarkable accomplishments of Heian women's literature, and of the Genji in particular, was the development of a prose style close to the speech habits of contemporary readers, an achievement not to be duplicated until a movement in the Meiji period. In the Genji, it is not the fulfillment or frustration of desire that becomes the focus of the narrative, so much as the elegant and elaborate process of courtship, the poetry, the carefully chosen words, the calligraphy, the choice of paper, the evocative scent, the overheard music. Almost every aspect of social intercourse is transformed into a highly refined aesthetic mode. Genji consolidates his power not as a scheming and ambitious politician, but as a man of miyabi, literally courtliness, as a noble devoted to the acquisition of courtly graces, good taste, and aesthetic sensibility. The famous 18th century scholar Motoori Norinaga characterized the whole of the Genji as a work of mono no aware, a phrase often translated as the sadness or pathos of things. Norinaga uses the phrase to mean something closer to a sensitivity to things or a capacity to be deeply moved by things. The excessive attention given to aesthetic media in the tale of Genji led Emperor Juntoku to observe that truly all the different arts and disciplines are to be found in this one work. A notion that ran counter to the assumptions of Heian clan-oriented society, the idea of an individual whose identity transcends kinship and marital ties. And indeed, a contemporary Heian reader would have been particularly moved by many of the different things in this book, because as Shirani shows so well, Murasaki Shikibu was flouting so many of the mores and standards of the day. Instead of moving toward a climax, peripatia, and resolution, Murasaki Shikibu continually augmented and amplified her narrative in a semi-circular motion. The Narabi chapters in the Genji are semi-autonomous supplementary units that can be appreciated individually even as they echo and amplify the base chapters. As the chronologies 
the major tradition of Genji scholarship dating back to the Kamakura period, reveal Murasaki Shikibu plotted her ever-expanding narrative on a precise time grid that uses temporal parallelism to reveal different sides of the hero's life. And this is one thing we have to keep in mind, is that at the time she was writing this, it started as a short piece, and she was serializing this, and they were starting to go into circulation, and then she was going and touching up chapters and bridging gaps between chapters and so on like that, and she modulates throughout um, the different views we get. And so our, our views of Genji will very much change over time. How about this statement? No earlier prose fiction by a woman survives today. And I fact-checked that against Moore since he had done uh, such a meticulous work of excavation and scholarship across world literature in his two-volume history of the novel, you know, 20-some years after this was written, and indeed Moore confirmed that, yes, this appears to be true. We do have earlier prose fiction, of course, but we don't know what the gender was. So we can say that no earlier prose fiction by a woman survives today. In the early chapters, Genji pursues love outside the formal institution of marriage, either in illicit liaisons with high-ranking ladies or in affairs with women on the social periphery. Romantic love, as exemplified by Genji's pursuit of the young Murasaki, emerges in opposition to the kind of orthodox, arranged, aristocratic marriage that Genji, Genji has with Aoi. In the Wakana chapters, however, Murasaki Shikibu shifts her attention from these amorous pursuits to the marital problems faced by Murasaki, now ensconced at the center of the Rokujo Inn, that is, Genji's palace that he builds and then installs all of his women in different portions of, notably uh, linked to seasons and flowers. Needless to say, amorous adventures never end in the Genji. Murasaki and the Fujitsubo lady, the two central heroines of part one, fulfill male erotic ideals, that of a virginal, submissive, and modest daughter-slash-lover, and that of a more transcendental or celestial mother-slash-lover. The two roughly correspond to what Gilbert and Gubar in their uh, The Mad Woman in the Attic, great, great work of feminist literary criticism, by the way, call the angel in the house and the Madonna in heaven. The jealous, res resentful, strong-willed, and destructive Rokujo lady, by contrast, represents the antithesis of the ideal of female innocence or purity and functions in a manner suggestive of the mad woman in the attic. And the Rokujo lady, by the way, is one of the best characters. Not a whole lot of screen time, but when there is, it really counts and is responsible for lending uh, an explicit supernatural dimension to the novel. Reading the Genji requires a double movement, understanding it as a narrative in light of plot and characters and in relation to socio-political history, and as a lyric in terms of such poetic elements as imagery, rhythm, diction, tone, and allusions. The Genji unfolds over 75 years, three generations, and four imperial reigns, and presents over 500 characters. At the same time, however, it gravitates towards intensely emotional and meditative scenes in which the language, rhetoric, and themes of poetry are foregrounded, and in which the primary reference is not to an external world so much as to other poetic texts. In a work of this kind, it is misleading to speak of the text in terms of plot or theme. In the Genji, the essence of nature and human life tends to be grasped in terms of their end, in their dying moments rather than in their birth or creation. The dominant season of the Genji is autumn, when nature, in all its melancholy hues, seems to wither and fade away. In contrast to Marcel Proust's A la recherche du temps perdu, to which the Genji has been frequently compared, man is unable to conquer or transcend external time. Instead, remembrance becomes a constant and painful reminder of loss and transience. 
In the Genji, the psychological growth or maturation of a character often continues in the life of his or her successor. And this is an understatement. And this makes one of the greatest thrills of reading the book is watching this happen and how Murasaki Shikibu does it. The Genji not only transforms plot conventions, established poetic motifs and contemporary norms, it constantly reworks itself. Murasaki Shikibu returns with great tenacity to the past, not just to unify the extended narrative, but to cast earlier sequences and episodes in a different and often critically revealing light. This complex process operates not in any single episode nor in the sum total, but in the imaginary space that Murasaki Shikibu's chapters and sequences create between themselves by their interactions. One of Murasaki Shikibu's remarkable accomplishments was the development of a narrative style and technique that could depict the multiplicity and flow of the individual consciousness, particularly the interpenetration of past and present. By closely juxtaposing the thoughts of the characters, the author reveals how the individual is bound to be misunderstood by others because each person interprets words and actions in light of his or her own private history. Moto Ori Norinaga openly attacks this notion of the Genji as a moral parable, arguing that the Genji should not be judged from a Confucian or Buddhist viewpoint or by foreign values that measure the narrative in moral or didactic terms. Instead, the Genji, according to Norinaga, must be understood in terms of mono no aware, an emotional sensitivity to things involving sympathy for and harmony with others. To know mono no aware is to understand and respond emotionally to the beauty and sorrow of nature and human circumstance. If in the early chapters, excessive and uncontrollable passion is a kind of celebration of life, a mark of love and heroic vitality. In part two, the same emotion takes on an increasingly negative Buddhistic overtone. And the reason that may seem jarring with the uh, Moto Ori Norinaga quote about not judging it on moral or uh, religious terms, and then suddenly me making uh, that assertion, or rather Shirane, making that assertion is because Shirane does show how there are definitely elements of Shinto and Buddhism and uh, Confucianism in the work. They can't be ignored. The title of the last chapter, Yume no Ukihashi, The Floating Bridge of Dreams, is a potent metaphor not only for the secular and spiritual quests engaged in by the central characters, but for the extended narrative itself, which remains to the end tantalizingly and richly ambiguous. That gets at what Dylan called the gauziness of the novel. Ultimately, Murasaki Shikibu does not focus on the question of how to achieve salvation, whether a character has attained this difficult goal, or even if he or she is on the proper path, though these questions are raised in the course of the narrative. Instead, she turns her attention to the emotional conflicts these spiritual aspirations create. Throughout the Genji, Murasaki Shikibu reveals that the individual is defined not so much by thought and action as by the emotional intensity with which he or she perceives the world. And so from all of those excerpts from experts, there are three important Japanese concepts for this novel. Do you need to really know them before going into it? No, I certainly didn't. The novel will teach them to you. But the first you may have heard is Miyabi, which is the courtliness, playing the game, which Genji does so well. But this gets at this whole aesthetic mode of life back then, of social life back then. You excelled socially by your aesthetic understanding, your aesthetic prowess, to be able to write extremely good poetry, to show how well acquainted you were with the best of Chinese poetry, which is what was important even in Heian, Japan at that time, which was heavily influenced by Tang China. And so being this suave, cultured, cosmopolitan esthete 
is Miyabi from page to page throughout the entire course of the novel. It is Miyabi that is so important for characters. If uh, a girl is going to try to catch the attention of Genji or some uh, nobleman to try and increase her upward mobility as far as it was possible at that time, it's going to be an understanding uh, of Miyabi that's going to help with that. Knowing the rules, but knowing how to use those rules to also set yourself a little bit apart. To show that you know the rules so well that you know how to cleverly bend them and assert your own style and swagger. And then there's kaimami, which I don't think I've said, but kaimami is this term that the Japanese have for literally peeking and getting a sneak peek. Uh, what more ultimately uh, drew the conclusion of a voyeur. That's exactly what it is. It's voyeurism and and very much so we are voyeurs uh, in reading this novel. But so many, I, I dare say all of the most monumental events of the book are, and especially the, the trials and travails of the book, are set into motion because of Kaimami. And what's going on is that at the time, men and women were completely separated, as we heard in the Norton anthology. So women, especially high-ranking women, they were kept occluded behind screens always. And so a nobleman would hear of this woman that existed. And of course, the, the intrigue is already uh, aroused. Uh, but then you aren't even able to talk to her face to face. You're not even allowed to see her. And most of the time you have to communicate with her through an intermediary. So one of her handmaids uh, will have to carry messages back and forth or your poems that you're writing back and forth. But you can imagine how such repression, such concealment would ultimately lead to disaster after disaster, uh, mostly for the women, the poor women of the time. But in these moments of kaimami, when there is maybe a gap in the screen or a blind has a hole in it, or something affords a man a peek at a woman he's not supposed to be seeing, even if she's fully clothed. This sends characters into hysterics. I mean, it's just the, the whole situation there of hey on Japan, Miyabi, is just completely set up to blow up in everyone's face, just to cause these disasters, because it just causes this, the human desire to burn to a point where it just bubbles over and cause, causes uncontrollable, though that's not to say that they're excusable actions, but it, you'll see uh, that it's, it accounts for so much of what happens in the novel. And then finally, as you heard a few times, there's Mono no Aware. And this I actually did originally read in that Michael Durda essay, but you know, it didn't stick. Now, it will never be gone from me because I have been fully exposed and uh, enmeshed in what it really means. And I have come to learn that it very much describes how I am, sort of like some of my opening lines. If you're the type of person, you know, for whom that first autumn chill just fills you with all these intense feelings and you're just a, you're always caught up in the longings of the best parts of your childhood and you're very sensitive to people's moods and emotions around you and you know seeing different flowers feeling uh, different winds and breezes and looking at painting and of course reading you know you're just very this very heightened sensitivity but that's tinged with maybe a, just a little bit of melancholy it's got sort of a sadness for the impermanence of things. And I can't remember who said it that we read, but it ultimately leads us to, to realize that we're very sensitive to beauty, to aesthetic beauty. But part of that sensitivity is this underlying awareness that all beauty, all aesthetic beauty is fleeting. But then it circles back on itself again and we realize that it's so beautiful because of its fleetingness. Of all of my years of reading, I really don't know if I've 
ever encountered a book that goes into mono no aware at the level of the Genji. Pieces of different novels, yes, but it's never been so highly concentrated and sustained for so long in one book. Okay, so what I want to do now is finally turn to the book itself. <laughs> There's been a lot of talking about the book without being in the book, uh, but I want to turn to the book itself. Obviously, if I were to sit here and go through every single thing that I wanted to comment on, this video would last for days. So again, like I said earlier, I do plan on doing a second video at some point where I just focus on the book and not all of this extra stuff that's targeted for people who are there, aren't familiar with the book or haven't read it and are curious about it. But now I want to go through and uh, highlight some things to give you a flavor of the book itself. He wept as he thought back over the past, making as he did so a vision of infinite beauty. So even as Genji is sitting here weeping and crying over the past, we're told that this sight of him doing so is actually a vision of infinite beauty. So again, this is that uh, mono no aware, you know, it's that sadness tinged with the past, tinged with that being beautiful. But it's interesting, you know, to call it a vision of infinite beauty. And I just thought about how that's often what some of the best art aspires to, is to capture a vision that to the artist is of infinite beauty, or at least the art that I respond to the most. There are these two chapters called the exile chapters, the Akashi and Suma, which are the place names where Genji puts himself in a sort of self-exile in the hills away from the city because of the, his evil stepmother you know, setting things in motion to get ready to clamp down on him, he pretty much preempts that uh, and extricates himself. And again, that's actually based on the evil stepmother tale that was very much a convention at the time of Shikibu's writing. And these chapters are gorgeous chapters. I loved these two chapters. But in Suma, it says that autumn in such a place yielded the sum of melancholy. I love that formulation. And again, the mixing of mono no aware with that autumn season, which very much dominates in this book. In fact, there's this ongoing debate on what's better, spring or autumn. And definitely the Japanese sentiment lends itself to autumn, as does mine. It was the 10th or so of the third month, a delicious time of mild skies and expansive moods. How beautiful is that formulation? And immediately when I read that, I decided I wanted to start uh, appropriating that for uh, fall and just saying, hey, man, this is that delicious time of mild skies and expansive moods. And just thinking about how the season as the sky is spreading, it's also spreading and expanding your mood. I'll just say that this character is an old woman and she is from Akashi which is on the shores, but also more like countrified or more the hills than the city. But uh, this old woman says in poetry, ripples of old age come wrinkling upon a shore generously blessed. Who could blame such an old nun for constantly dripping brine? And what she's expressing is that she's weeping. Those drippings of brine and saltiness mixed in with the shores and the ocean. That's referring to tears. But she's expressing how joyful she is at having lived into old age, which was not always a joyful thing at the time. But I just love the intermingling of the ripples of old age wrinkling upon a shore generously blessed. I mean, the, the wrinkles of your face and the ripples of you know, the, the tide ebbing and flowing. It's just so beautiful. These are poems back and forth between uh, two characters. And this is, this is expressing very complicated emotions. Or I should say the, the situation is a little complex and I don't want to give anything away. Um, but I'll just set it up to say that this is a situation where you've got 
a, a character who has sort of pined after another character, but now one of them is dying and yet has put the other in a really difficult situation. I know that probably doesn't help. Uh, but one character says to the other, when the end has come and from my smoldering pyre smoke rises at last, I know this undying flame even then will burn for you. It's sort of, there's an element of unrequited love, just saying, hey, you know, I've gone after you, you've rebuffed me, but even when they set me on fire at my funeral, those flames and that smoldering fire, that will still be, be my desire for you burning. It's, it's an intense image. And she says, I would rise with you, yes, and vanish forever, that your smoke and mine might decide which one of us burns with the greater sorrows. And just incredible. And then get this, his tears flowed faster now, and he wrote his reply lying down, between bouts of weeping, the words made no sense and resembled the tracks of strange birds. Just think about the way Japanese looks anyway, and the fact that he's so emotional, so wrecked over her reply. This is from yet another poem. I hear very well all the sadness of midnight in what you have played, but I have no words myself, save a music of my own. This is in response to hearing music played. And the description of what the character hears in that music is all the sadness of midnight. This is, to me, there's so much poetic compression in those few words. It's something that when we think of all the sadness of midnight, we feel what is being said, even though I can't immediately lend a suitable and satisfactory definition to it. This is a little bit of a mixture of narrative and poetic exchange between two characters. I'll set this up only insofar as to say that one character is watching another character fade away, prepare for death, let's say. And this character means a great deal to the other. But just listen to the mixture of narrative and poetry. And I'll try to modulate my voice a little bit so you know when we are where. We start off with narrative. With a pang, she saw how happy her little reprieve had made him. And she grieved to imagine him soon in despair. Alas, not for long will you see what you do now. Any breath of wind may spill from a hoggy frond, the last trembling drop of dew. It was true, her image fitted all too well. No dew could linger on such tossing fronds, the thought was unbearable. He answered while he gazed out into the garden. When all life is due, and at any touch may go, one drop, then the next, how I pray that you and I may leave nearly together. He wiped the tears from his eyes. Her majesty added, in this fleeting world where no dewdrop can linger in the autumn wind, why imagine us to be unlike the bending grasses? They made a perfect picture as they talked, one well worth seeing, but the moment could not last, as Genji well knew, though he wished it might endure a thousand years. He mourned that nothing could detain someone destined to go. Yearning too fondly for a twilight one autumn many years ago, I saw the end come at last in a cruel dream at dawn. This one really hit me, not even so much because of what's going on, but there was something about the way it's worded. Yearning too fondly for a twilight one autumn many years ago, I saw the end come at last in a cruel dream at dawn. I think this will touch many of us because as we grow older, we, at least people like me, we tend to remember very fondly those twilights of an autumn evening. In a way, yes, they all end as all things do, but because of the way that they affect our memory so deeply and our emotions, our sense of mono no aware, they live on forever on repeat. In a way, we live our lives suspended between those past twilight evenings and the present dawns. Jiju 
had not been as close to her mistress as the others, but after the long time they had spent together, she had come to take occasional comfort from the hope that in the river's frightful roar, one still caught the purling of happier shoals ahead. My goodness. Just as language, just as a string of words, this is beautiful. Let's listen to just that string of beautiful pearls, P-E-A-R-L-S, when uh, we get this mix that has that striking word, purling, P-U-R-L-I-N-G. The river's frightful roar, one still caught the purling of happier shoals ahead. There are so many scenes in this book. It's, it's an endless, bottomless book. But I want to pick four specific scenes and spend just a little bit of time with them because I think that they're key scenes to pull you more into this world and give you even more of a sense of what the book's like. One scene is a scene between two sisters. And the backstory here is that their father has just died, leaving them very, very fraught, and especially their mother, because now their mother is in a situation where not only is she sort of jeopardized, remember at this in this point in history, and especially in this culture, without a man of certain note, uh, a woman's life is absolutely miserable. And so it's incumbent upon every woman, and, and every man for that matter, to make sure that their daughters are set up for a bright and certain future. So at this point, the father has passed away and the mother is fretting over what to do for her daughters. And of course, everybody's in mourning. It's a, it's a pretty terrible situation. But the two sisters decide to play a game of go between each other. And whoever wins sort of gets the rights to this cherry blossom tree that's nearby. And of course, as you would expect with a Japanese novel, cherry blossoms feature very prominently. But I'm going to read this entire passage. It's not too long. And it is, again, a mix of narrative, dialogue, and poetry exchange while they're playing Go. And I hope that you'll get a sense through this of how beautiful this book can be and also how deftly and robustly Murasaki Shikibu interweaves all of the everything that's going on. She isn't letting any moment of an image of a flower or a passing breeze or knowing something deeply that she's already communicated to the reader about this person's past years and years ago. She's never letting a chance to weave all those things together uh, to create this just these beautiful novelistic moments. So here we go. The third month came. Once the cherries were in bloom, falling petals clouded the sky, and the leisure of blossom time left the mistress of staff, the uh, two girls' mother, with little enough to do. There could be nothing wrong even with sitting near the veranda. Her daughters must then have been 18 or 19. Both were delightful in person and looks. The elder was so vivid, stylish, and proud that one felt she would indeed be wasted on a commoner. She fairly exuded charm in her timely choice of a cherry blossom long dress and a carrier rose layering, and her deportment suggested dignity and intelligence as well. The younger sister, in light plum pink, her hair glinting with a brilliant sheen, had all the grace of spring willow fronds. Yet despite the tall, slender poise of her figure and her air of graver depth, many felt it was the elder who conveyed the most exquisite appeal. Already I hope you're picking up on what a mise-en-scene uh, Shikibu can set up here with the, the laziness of the moment in the midst of turmoil and upheaval with the cherry blossoms and just hanging out on the veranda in spite of what you need to be doing. And then also the opulence, the description of what characters wear. The four headline and sweep of her hair presented a lovely picture as they faced each other at Go. And the Fujiwara advisor sat beside them to referee. This is their younger brother. 
Just then, his elder brothers peered in. You do think a lot of him, they cried. You even have him refereeing your game. Both knelt on one knee in a manly fashion, and the women in attendance straightened themselves as well as they could. I have been too busy at the palace and have fallen behind, the captain complained. It is so disappointing. How could you forget all about a poor controller when his duties leave him still less free to wait on his sisters? The young lady stopped playing and put on a very pretty show of bashfulness. I so often wish that his late excellency were still here, meaning their father, the captain said, watching them with tears in his eyes. At twenty-seven or eight, he made an admirable figure of a man, and he longed only to give his sisters the future his father had wished for them. The sisters sent someone to pick a branch from a particularly lovely cherry tree that grew among the others in the garden nearby. There has never been one like it, they exclaimed, toying with the spray. When you were young, the captain said, you quarreled over these flowers, each of you crying that they were hers, and his late excellency awarded them to the elder of you, at which our mother decided that the tree itself belonged to the younger. I myself did not make so loud a fuss about it, but it meant a great deal to me too. He went on, the thought that this cherry tree is old now brings to mind all the years that have passed, and the sorrow of having outlived so many people is almost too much for me to bear. He lingered there longer than usual, amid laughter and tears. Now that he was married, he no longer came on leisurely visits, but he had stayed on this time for the love of the flowers. The mistress of staff, their mother, who still had all her looks, seemed much too young to have such grown-up sons. What made retired Emperor Reze so keen was above all his fond memory of the time when he had wanted her, and he insisted on seeking her daughter only to keep that old fancy alive. And this is something that will be repeated throughout the Genji, um, sort of uh, transmuting or transferring your love for one onto another and sort of trying to imprint them uh, and make them into the one you once loved. Her son said of that prospect that their sister might go to him. There is no reason at all to be eager. The timely choice seems always to be the one that gains broad approval. He is a great pleasure to behold, it is true, for there is none like him. But one has the impression that he is no longer what he was. The harmonies of flutes and strings, the pleasures of blossoms or birdsong, charm the eye or the ear only in their time. What about the heir apparent? They're talking, discussing to what man the daughters may go. I wonder, she replied. A very powerful lady, you see, has always claimed him so much as her own. I worry that the poor thing might just be laughed at if she went. If only His Excellency were still alive, he could have managed something for the time being, at least, whatever her future may be in the end. The thought saddened them all. Once the captain and the others were gone, the sisters returned to their game, wagering the cherry tree that each had always claimed. Two out of three wins the flowers, they teased each other. It was getting dark and they finished their game near the veranda. The women rolled up the blinds, and each cheered on her own mistress. Just then, as so often, the lieutenant turned up at the Fujiwara advisor's room. Finding the brothers gone and no one about, he stole up to peer through the open door. This is a moment of kaimami. The foolish young man felt as though happy fortune had brought him a vision of living Buddhas. Twilight mists somewhat veiled the scene, but his ardent gaze discerned nonetheless that the one in cherry blossom could only be she. She did indeed make a most lovely token of blossoms soon to be gone, and he lamented more bitterly than ever that she would soon go to someone else. The casually disposed young woman looked very pretty in the evening light. The right, which Tyler footnotes as the younger sister, won, won the game. Where is the coma victory music, excited voices cried. His Excellency awarded the left a tree that leaned west, which means that he favored the right. That is where all the trouble began, somewhere, someone on the right cheerfully declared. The lieutenant did not know what they were talking about, but still it all sounded like fun, and he felt like joining in. He decided that that would be tactless of him, though, when they were all in such a casual mood, and instead he went away. A man who's showing restraint. This is something atypical for the Genji. After that, he went about spying in case a similar chance should come. <laughs> the sisters spent day and night contesting each other's claim to the blossoming tree, 
But one stormy evening, they were horrified to see petals flying in all directions. So let me just reiterate here up to this point. The narrative has really sort of amped up the anguish and sense of loss they feel at the father being gone and the cherry tree that they've battled it out over the game of Go for is now representing their late father. And this is in the midst of their uncertain future and their mother and their brothers around them trying to figure out which man to get them to. And it has been good fun for the sisters and they've kept a good attitude uh, over this. But now all of a sudden we get this image of that beautiful cherry tree, their father, getting racked by howling winds and storms. The loser said, and these are poetic exchanges now, Ah, cherry blossoms, how one's heart trembles for them when stormy winds blow, although anyone can see they themselves care not at all. Saishol added, Such flowers as these blossom there before our eyes only to scatter. Never mind that we have lost. I shall not long hold the grudge. The sister on the right said, It is the world's way that the wind should scatter them, but how sad it is to see blossoms fade away, even while still on the bow. And her taifu, meaning one of her women, come wayward petals, who because it pleases you fall beside the lake. When you are foam on the waves, even so do come my way. A page girl from the winning side went down into the garden, gathered lots of fallen petals from under the tree and brought them to her mistress. You may well scatter on the winds through the wide sky, O oh cherry blossoms, yet I shall gather you in and enjoy you as my own. Then the left's nareki, are those sleeves of yours broad enough to overspread all cherry petals and retain their full beauty just for you and no one else? Meaning, are your sleeves of your gowns, your dress, wide enough to shelter all the world's cherry trees from the winds and rains of this world. As I hope that you're perceiving, I, I cannot describe on how many poetic levels this book operates. Obviously, half the time they're talking about one thing concretely and another thing discreetly. All right, in the Uji chapters, there is this uh, part of the narrative where, well, guess what? There are two sisters whose father has uh, recently passed away, and they are in a very precarious situation, and there is now a male character there with them. And they are, if I remember correctly, they are packaging up incense, and they are tying ribbon around the incense, and they're tying them in trefoil knots, that is a knot with three uh, lobes from the ribbon. But once again, that imagery of the trefoil knots is, is used so poetically and beautifully. The autumn wind along the river, a sound so familiar for years, troubled and saddened them while they prepared for the first anniversary of their father's death. The counselor and the adept looked after most of the arrangements. Frail and sorrowing, the sisters pursued the fine work of making the vestments and the adornments for the scripture texts under the guidance of their gentlewomen, and one imagined all too easily their plight without this help. The counselor himself arrived and presented heartfelt greetings on an occasion that marked for them the end of mourning. The adept came as well. The sisters were just then arranging the threads for presenting the incense and saying to each other, I follow even in this guise the thread of the days. The counselor understood them because past the edge of the blind, he spied a full winding frame, just visible through a gap in a standing curtain. Kai Mami, once again. Oh, that I might thread on it the gleaming beads of my own tears, he said, struck to imagine Lady Issa feeling the same way. The elder sister within the blinds, too shy to show by her reply that she knew the poem because it was very much improper to know certain things as a woman at this time, uh, especially Chinese poetry and the Chinese language, for that matter. For Su Rayuki had evoked his misery on losing someone he loved in terms of courage as slender as a thread, and the memory reminded her how well an old poem may speak 
for oneself. And how beautiful is that? The memory reminded her how well an old poem may speak for oneself. And the Genji itself, this book, reminded me how well old literature can help speak for oneself. The counselor was already engaged in composing the dedicatory prayer, and to explain his intention in offering these images and scriptures, he wrote, In these trefoil knots may you secure forever our eternal bond, that our threads may always merge in that one place where they meet. Obviously, he's talking about the trefoil knots that the sisters are tying around this incense in commemoration of their father. I couldn't help but note that the trefoil knots are also referring to that man uh, who is actually a kaoru and the two sisters, Oigimi and Nakanokimi, and that it says in that may always merge in that one place where they meet is referring to the father, Hachi no Miya. And I just thought it was beautiful, that imagery. It happens to be the three of them, and they're working on tying these knots. And in that knot, in between the three lobes, they're sort of referencing that that knot, that merging, is the father. The, the deceased father is, has brought them and is still holding them all together. Okay, now here is just a short little vignette, but it is gorgeous. Especially, like I said at the very beginning of the video, if you're someone who's very sensitive to and affected by snow. Uh, at this point, Genji has really made a name for himself. We're about almost 400 pages into the novel, but there's just this really nice, peaceful, joy-filled moment where his page girls are outside of the palace and they're rolling snowballs, just having a good time. But it says the snow was very deep by now and more was falling. The waning light set off pine and bamboo prettily from one another, and Genji's face took on a clearer glow, more than the glory of flowers and fall leaves that season by season capture everyone's heart. It is the night sky in winter, with snow a glitter beneath a brilliant moon, that in the absence of all color speaks to me strangely and carries my thoughts beyond this world. There is no higher wonder or delight. Whoever called it dreary understood nothing. He had the blinds rolled up. The moon illumined all before them in its single color, while the garden shivered under the weight of snow. The brook uttered pathetic sobs, and desolate ice lay across the lake. I think this passage captures perfectly my feelings for winter and for snow and for just that overcast weather that, like he said, whoever calls it dreary understood nothing. I think I may even love winter more than autumn, just as Genji is expressing it here. And for the last of the four scenes that I'll point out, I turn to what is often cited as the most famous scene in the entire novel, this comes from the chapter called Hotaru, and it is the defense of fiction section. And it's actually kind of funny because Genji approaches a female character, Tomakazura, I think. Let's see. I think it's Tomakazura. But he approaches her and she's reading fiction. And he at first sort of attacks fiction, and then she counter argues, and then he ends up backtracking and changing his views. And all throughout, we can hear Murasaki Shikibu giving her own defense of what she's doing here in The Tale of Genji. And it's also notable, as Stephen Moore pointed out, that this is the earliest defense of prose fiction as a legitimate form of art that we have. Finding her enthralled by works like these, which lay scattered about everywhere, Genji exclaimed, oh no, this will never do. Women are obviously born to be duped without a murmur of protest. There is hardly a word of truth in all this, as you know perfectly well, but there you are caught up in fables, taking them quite seriously and writing away without a thought for your tangled hair in this stiflingly warm rain. He laughed, but then went on. Without stories like these about the old days, though, how would we ever pass the time when there is nothing else to do? Besides, among these lies, there certainly are some plausibly touching scenes, convincingly told. And yes, we know they are fictions, but even so, we are moved and half-drawn for no real reason to the pretty, suffering heroine. We may disbelieve the blatantly impossible, but still be amazed by magnificently contrived wonders. 
And although these pall on quiet second hearing, some are still fascinating. Lately, when my little girl has someone read to her and I stand there listening, I think to myself what good talkers there are in the world and how this story too must come straight from someone's persuasively glib imagination. But perhaps not. And then Tamakazura gives this cutting ripost. Yes, of course, for various reasons, someone accustomed to telling lies will no doubt take tales that way, but it seems impossible to me that they should be anything other than simply true. She pushed away her inkstone. This really, uh, as we <laughs> get from having read the book up to this point, really checks Genji. He continues, I have been very rude to speak so ill to you of tales. They record what has gone on ever since the age of the gods. The chronicles of Japan and so on give only a part of the story. It is tales that contain the truly rewarding particulars. He laughed. Not that tales accurately describe any particular person. Rather, the telling begins when all those things the teller longs to have pass on to future generations. Whatever there is about the way people live their lives, for better or worse, that is a sight to see or a wonder to hear, overflow the teller's heart. To put someone in a good light, one brings out the good only, and to please other people, one favors the oddly wicked. But none of this, good or bad, is removed from life as we know it. Tales are not told the same way in the other realm, meaning China. And even in our own, the old and new ways are of course not the same. But although one may distinguish between the deep and the shallow, it is wrong always to dismiss what one finds in tales as false. There is talk of expedient means, also in the teaching that the Buddha, in his great goodness, left us, and many passages of the scriptures are all too likely to seem inconsistent and so to raise doubts in the minds of those who lack understanding. But in the end, they have only a single message, and the gap between enlightenment and the passions is, after all, no wider than the gap that entails sets off the good from the bad. To put it nicely, there is nothing that does not have its own value. And then the narrator steps in, and it's a bit, a bit cheeky, as you'll find, but just this curt little sentence that says, he mounted a very fine defense of tales. 